All right, let's continue in what is probably the most well-known scene in all of Revelation, chapter 19, where the army of God, led by Lord Jesus Christ, comes down, killing the Antichrist and his armies. So let's read on. Verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, the one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. Wow. What an introduction. So in righteousness, uh, we got the heaven open, white horse, one sitting in Faithful, on it is called faithful and true, and then in righteousness he judges, it makes war. Well, this kind of just uh, 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 sums up what is said in Psalms ninety six thirteen: before the Lord, before Yahweh, for He comes, for He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness, and the peoples in His faithful. But we read on, his eyes are like a flame of fire. Well, this is indicative of div divinity and fury. And, uh, you know, I mean, the eyes are almost like the eyes of what we read earlier in chapter 1. And on his head are many diadems, many diadems without number. It's another way of saying, this is the king of kings. This is the Lord of lords. He is ruler over all the kings of the earth over all the rulers of heaven. And he has a name written on, that no one knows but himself. Well, I guess we could say it's not to be known until after this event, unless, of course, it's the very next verse, the word of God, uh, which we will read on and see. So verse 13, <clears throat> he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the Word of God. So that's one name by which he's called. But he's wearing, he's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Dip, the word is bapto, where we get the word baptize, to dip or to die. But the question is, dipped in blood, whose blood? Well, I think the short answer is the blood of his enemies and the enemies of his bride. He's there to protect his bride. We read about this in Isaiah chapter 63, where Isaiah prophesies and says, Who is this who comes from Edom? Now that's modern day Jordan. In crimson garments from Basra. That's the capital of Edom. Who, he who is splendid in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength, it is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Well, you're clothed in great apparel. Why is your apparel red and your garments like his, who treads in the winepress? The answer, I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples, no one was with me. So this is something that he does and with nobody's help. I tried them in my anger, and I trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. It's hard to imagine the patience of the Lord in all this. I looked, but there was no one to help. I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. I trampled down the peoples in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. 
So one thing we can say here, it appears to me like there's some action that's already taking place of spilling blood uh, since uh, the, the charge from this army scene has not happened yet, that Jesus is leading, and he's already in a blood-stained robe. So let's read on. Because from the prophet um, Isaiah, we also read in chapter 34, Draw near, O nations, to hear and give attention, O people. So this is for all the earth to hear. Let the earth hear and all that fills it, the world and all that comes from it. So this is a major big announcement. For Yahweh is enraged against all the nations and furious against their hosts. He has devoted them to destruction, has given them over for slaughter. Now, one thing might point out here, furious against all their hosts, that normally means principalities and powers of this dark world and of the heavenlies. Verse 3, their slain shall be cast out. And the stench of their corpse shall rise. The mountains shall flow with their blood. All the host of heaven shall rot away. And the skies roll up like a scroll. And their hosts shall fall as leaves fall from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. For my sword has drunk its fill in the heavens. So he's already been slaughtering in the heavens. Behold, it descends for judgment upon Edom, upon the people I have devoted to destruction. The Lord Yahweh has a sword. It is sated with blood. It is gorged with fat, with the blood of the lambs and the goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord Yahweh has sacrificed in Basra a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Wild oxen shall fall with them, and young steers with the mighty bulls. Their land shall drink its fill of blood, and their soil shall be gorged with fat. For the Lord Yahweh has a day of vengeance, a year of recompense. Why? For the cause of Zion. My holy city, my holy nation, the promised land, my people for the cause of Zion and the streams of Edom shall be turned into pitch and her soil into sulfur. Her land shall become burning pitch. Night and day it shall not be quenched. Its smoke shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. So it gives us a little more insight on this, on the robe that he's wearing that is dipped in blood. Now, something else that um, we have touched on it a few times, but we have not gone in depth. And that is the path that the Lord takes when he returns. And there's a lot of scripture that says the Lord comes from Sinai. He comes from Egypt and he comes from Sinai. He comes through Edom and through Basra. Now, as previously discussed, there are some significant prophecies and parallels. And now we're going to look at Deuteronomy 33 that Jesus likely follows the same pattern of Exodus and Passover um, in Revelation. So let's look at Deuteronomy 33. This is Moses speaking. And we've gone through this before, but it's very well worth uh, going back over and refreshing our memories. This is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the people of Israel before his death, before they crossed the Jordan River into the promised land. He said, Yahweh came from Sinai and dawn from Seir. Okay, and remember, we looked at the verb. Yahweh came. Came is written in the perfect tense. So that means it's translated three different ways. Translated as past. Yahweh came. As present. Yahweh is coming. Or as future. Yahweh will come. 
from Sinai and Don from Seir. Mount Seir, well, this is the mountain range from southern Jordan in which the city of Basra is located. So from Sinai and Don from Seir upon us, he shone forth from Mount Paran. He he came once again in this in this perfect tense. So he came, he is coming, and he will come from the ten thousands of holy ones. Now we have not seen this happen yet. So he's going to come with ten thousands of holy ones. And this happens where? What we're reading about now in Revelation 19 with flaming fire at his right hand. This was also foretold in Judges, Judges 5, 4. Yahweh, when you went out from Seir, when you marched upon the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before Yahweh, even Sinai before Yahweh, the God of Israel. So that this is just the tip of the iceberg of many desert prophecies. Um, so uh, throughout Scripture, God has promised that he will return, that he will march through the desert. He'll be delivering his people from exile. Uh, it is promised throughout Scripture that Yahweh, the Messiah, is going to come with wrath and judgment to crush his enemies, which are also the enemies of Israel his bride. And so we listed a few representative passages here in Genesis, Numbers, Deuteronomy, 1 Samuel, Psalms, Joel, Habakkuk, Isaiah, Malachi, Romans, and of course, Revelation. Now, uh, there's a couple of books I think that would do, that do a masterful job of explaining this that I would recommend for anybody that wants to dig deeper into this because these are rabbit holes worth digging uh, diving into. One is, is a book called Sinai to Zion, The Untold Story of the Triumphant Return of Jesus. And this is written by Joel Richardson. And then there's another book, The Passover King, exploring the prophetic connection between, the, between Passover, the end times, and the return of Jesus by Travis M. Snow. Both of these books are eye-openers. Both of them provide a very thorough study of the Old Testament desert prophecies concerning the Lord's second coming following the path of Exodus. But we're going to read on. Because there is speculation that the wilderness that is mentioned in Revelation 12, remember uh, the wilderness where the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Also later in that chapter, the woman was given two wings of a great eagle so, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and a times and half a time. So for three and a half years, as well as the mountains that is mentioned in, by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. Um, all this, especially the mountains, but the wilderness as well, could very well be the mountainous area of Edom. Uh, and Jesus, uh, especially when compared with what he says to the map, it starts to really make sense because it has to be somewhere, right? And what he said in the Olivet Discourse was, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, Standing in the holy place in the temple, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And where is Judea in relation to Jerusalem? It's all south. Where is Edom in relationship to Jerusalem and Judea? It's southeast. Okay, so it's south and southeast. And if we look at the map here, uh, you will see Jerusalem is just off the map, but it's up here. This is the land of Judah, which is all on the western side of the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River. Uh, and then uh, just south of Judah is the land of Edom. Okay. And for those that have been to Petra, Petra is there. But look here, here's the Seir Mountains and there's Basra. 
So you got Edom, the Seir Mountain, and Basra, and Jesus instructing uh, his disciples to flee from Judah uh, into the mountains. Well, this is all mountainous area down here. And then what you see, especially in modern day boundary, uh, the boundary of Egypt is something like that. Okay? And then here you see also on a larger scale where you see uh, Jerusalem, uh, which is just north of the Dead Sea, uh, north and, and uh, to the west. And then you see Edom down here. Okay? So hopefully that starts to make sense. Now, let's read on. Verse 14. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. So who is in this army? Well, we are told in chapter 17, it's the chosen and the faithful. And here's the verse, uh, 17 verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb. So that's the Antichrist and his armies and the armies of the, wor of the world that all congregate together in Armageddon. And the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So, I mean, those that are with him are the chosen and faithful as part of his army. So that's a definite. So let's look at chosen and faithful. Chosen, the word here is eklektos, uh, and it means chosen out of in the New Testament. It's uh, recorded only 22 times in all of New Testament, but only once in Revelation, and that is here. And it's chosen as a recipient of special privilege, the elect, especially beloved. So the chosen, the elect, set apart. Uh, here's three examples. And these are pretty relevant examples because in the parable of the wedding feast that was given by the king for his son, well, we just read that in the first half of Revelation chapter 19. Jesus says, for many are called, but few are chosen. That's the eclectos. In the Olivet Discourse, uh, just a couple of chapters later, he's, he says, if those days had not been cut short, what are those days? The days of tribulation, uh, great tribulation, Satan's wrath against man. No one would survive but for the sake of the elect. The eclectos. Those days would be shortened. Also in the Olivet Discourse, um, where Jesus says, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his what? Ekletos, his elect, from the four winds, from the one end of the heavens to the other. So this already has given a strong indication that his army, at, at, as a minimum, has saints, possibly angels as well, but we'll get to that. The faithful, so it's chosen and the faithful. Who are the faithful? The faithful in Greek is the pistos, the faithful, the true, the trusty, the believing. Um, uh, in uh, New Testament Greek in particular, it's a Christian believer, the elect, those who are set apart. Now let's go back to the Olivet Discourse because once again, this is the context that we're talking about. Who then is the faithful, the pistos, and wise servant? whom his master has set over his household to give them the food at the proper time. And later on in chapter 25, still in the Olivet Discourse, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful. Once again, the same word, pistos. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. There's that word again, over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Okay, let's read on. Because um, from we got all the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure. They were following him uh, on, a white, on white horses. So they're riding white horses. And from his mouth, Jesus, the lamb, comes a sharp sword with 
which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So those in the army, they're arrayed with fine linen, white and pure. Uh, we've already said it could be a combination. Um, However, let's also keep in mind that just a couple of verses before all this, the bride had just been what? Clothed. Uh, it had been granted her, the bride of Christ, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deed of the saints. And we read earlier back that out of the sanctuary came also the seven angels with seven plagues clothed in pure, bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. So we cannot rule out angels as well, but I think most definitely the saints will be part of the army. And then in verse 15, for his, from his mouth comes a short, sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron, correction, with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. So... Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword. So is it a literal sword coming out of his mouth? Uh, and this, John makes a big deal of this because five times this is emphasized in Revelation in chapters 1 and 2 and 19. Uh, and two verses earlier, we're told that the name by which he is called is what? The Word of God. Now this, I think, gives us a strong clue. Jesus is not wielding a sword in his hand but the words from his mouth is what's doing the conquering and the judging uh, and is the judging sword. After all, he is sovereign. He is omnipotent. All it, he needs is the spoken word to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And this uh, culminates from what we heard from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 11, 14, verse 4. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked because from his mouth comes a sharp sword his words psalms 2 verse 9 you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel so he will rule them with a rod of iron. But we read on on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And uh, this is also referred earlier in 1 Timothy by the Apostle Paul, chapter 6, verse 14, where Paul says, Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time, he who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be the honor and eternal dominion. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. This is a reiteration of what we read in chapter 17, verse 14. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them for what? He is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with him are called the chosen and faithful. This is the complete Jesus um, that we have talked about in past, especially when we reviewed uh, Revelation chapter 1, verses 7 through 18. This is the complete Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua the Messiah, the Anointed One in all of his glory. So let's read on. Verse 17, then I saw an angel standing in the sun with a loud voice. He called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all man, both free and slave, both small and great. A humongous tragedy of all that will have to suffer. 
from the prophet Ezekiel. Remember uh, the prophecy of Gog in the land of Magog, first, uh, chapter 39, verse 1. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog, who is the Antichrist, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, which is up in the land of Turkey. And I will turn you about and drive you forward and bring you up from the uttermost parts of the earth, of the north, excuse me, and lead you against the mountains of Israel. You shall fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your hordes and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to the birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. And this in particular is the most dishonorable way in Middle East, um, ancient Middle East culture to perish is to die in field and not even have a proper, proper burial. Ezekiel 39 uh, goes on in verse 17, Thus saith the Lord God, Speak to the birds of every sort and to all the beasts of the field. Assemble and come, gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you. A great sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel. And you shall eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth, of rams, of lambs, of he goats and bulls, all of them, fat beasts of Bashan. And you shall eat fat till you are filled and drink blood till you are drunk at the sacrificial feast that I am, I am Yahweh preparing for you. And you shall be filled at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men and all kinds of warriors, declares the Lord God. So come, gather for the great supper of God. And then John goes on, verse 19, he says, And I saw the beast, that being the Antichrist, the brute of a man. And the kings of the earth and with their armies gathered to make war against him who is sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and who and those who worship his image. Remember it was the false prophet that for, was forcing everybody to worship the image of the beast. So what happens? These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. It's a horrific scene. And we'd have to ask the question, why were the beast and the false prophet judged immediately and not at the second resurrection? Okay, most likely it's because the beast, the Antichrist, was guilty of proclaiming himself as God. And the false prophet was right there forcing worship of the beast. And this is probably seen as the highest crime anyone can um, uh, commit against our almighty God. Now it says that these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Now why does it say that? Why does it say thrown alive? I think most likely it's to iterate that these are not just dead corpses that have no feeling, that really do not exist other than just a matter of flesh and, and bone being burned up. But these are living beings being sentenced to a horrific, everlasting, conscious punishment. This is not annihilation. That is not what hell is about. 
And this is reiterated again in Revelation 20, verse 10, where it says, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of the fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, that we're reading about now. And they were tormented day and night forever and ever. And we could speak on and on and on about eternal punishment, but we'll let that speak for itself. Other than a reiteration by Jesus Christ himself, once again at the Olivet Discourse, then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So if, if, if the unbelievers think that they go to, on a separate uh, uh, punishment, it's all the same. And that finishes chapter 19. Revelation 20 starts... Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit in a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while, which we will read at a later time. So that's it for now. It's a fantastic joyous chapter and at the same time it's a very very sobering chapter of those who do not accept Jesus Christ what he provided free only for the acceptance of putting our trust in him so hopefully this will convict us all the more to really be courageous in our testimony of Jesus Christ. And there may be a day when we may love not our life unto death. So until then, amen and amen.